الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ما ما بعد tonight ان شاء الله تعالى we're going to be talking about ابراهيم عليه السلام ابراهيم عليه السلام a household of submission to الله سبحانه وتعالى brothers and sisters you've seen the fitting that happens around us these days we live in uh, in june it's the pride month right now and every now and then you have one of some of those muslim kids come out online and say something that would probably maybe shock many many people in the community and be surprised by that We've seen a lot of Muslims right now coming out, you know, claiming to be, for example, um, from the LGBTQ community. Parents, they're shocked, and they're asking what happened, what went wrong? Uh, why is this happening to my son, my daughter, for example? Why are they doing this? We've heard that many, many um, Muslims, even activists online, they come out. They're supposed to be representing Islam and Muslims, but then when they speak, you realize, oh my God, but these are not Muslim values. They're kind of like, they're bending under the pressure. And then every now and then we have uh, some of these youth coming out online and even openly renouncing Islam. And they call themselves ex-Muslims as well. What's going on in the world, Jamal? What's happening exactly? What is the biggest mistake? Where, what are we missing exactly in our households, in our society, that are leading this kind of exodus, unfortunately, from Islam, outside of Islam? And I know that a lot of people, alhamdulillah, they're so excited and happy every time they hear a shahada in the masjid. Mashallah, Islam is the most, the, the fastest growing religion in America, in the world. Maybe it's true, but we, but we also, we don't pay attention to there's a breach in the back. Yes, Muslims coming, people are coming to Islam, but we're also losing on the other front. A lot of Muslims leave in Islam. How can we stop this? What's the problem? Where exactly, what we need to really focus on? That's what we're going to be talking about over here. Because if there's, if there's any quality or any specific characteristic that we're missing, in our household, in ourselves, in our society, it's this one. The household that was very special about, when it comes to this character, it was the household of Ibrahim salam. This quality and this trait is called submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The true meaning of submission to the will of Allah azza wa What does that mean? So nowadays, if you look at why people leave Islam, they come out with these weird ideas about their ideologies and their way of thinking, their lifestyles and so on. What do you think the major reason for them to pronounce these ideologies and these new lifestyles? What is the number one reason for that? Anyone knows? Why do you think all these people coming out, you know, uh, uh, let's say, uh, renouncing Islam, or even um, in, the, in, some, in some cases just want to move into LGBTQ community, for example? What would be the reason? To fit in with the non-Muslims, right? What about the non-Muslims themselves? When they, when they start living this lifestyle, why? What is the number one reason for that? Social pressure. Social pressure? Because of what? Following the desires. Following the desires? Why, do we, why do we follow our desires? Like of what? Of, of love? Of God in society. The number one reason is because they cancel the concept of God in their lives. True. Once you remove God from the equation, what happens? There is no moral code anymore. Who said this is how it's supposed to be? Who said you have to be this, you have to be there, we have to do these things and, and abstain from these things? Who can tell you what is right and wrong anymore? When there is no God, it's left for people to decide. And then who gives you the authority to tell me that this is right and this is wrong? As a result, people develop what? That sense of individualism. That I would like to do whatever I want to do. And that's what we call it today, the whole concept of you know, being authentic and being genuine, and you have to be true to yourself and all that stuff and so on. But well, there's a, a, a simple fact over here in our society that we're missing is that no matter how much you try to be independent, no matter how much you try to be free as you want to be, as you call yourself to be free, no matter how much you try to do that, there is a fact that you cannot escape. And what is that, Ajama? You're going to eventually die. And if you die, what does that exactly mean? You don't have that much independence. Someone else is controlling your life. That's why in the Arabic language, when someone dies, what do we say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Subhanallah, there is no, I would say there's no other time where this word means the best to give you that peace and tranquility than today, in our time. Because when you say, inna lillah, we all belong to Allah, wa inna ilayhi raji'un, and to him our return shall be, this is exactly the manifestation of the anti 
basically culture of our time. Because when everybody's trying to be themselves, denying God completely, so as a result, they start acting the way they want to act. Whatever they want to do. No limitations. But if you know that you're gonna, you belong to somebody else, and that someone else controlling your life, and he, you're going to return back to him to be questioned about it, then eventually you're going to start behaving better. I'm going to be responsible for it. That's what we call taslim, which means submission to the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Salat al-Maghrib, I decided the ayat from Surah al-Baqarah, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduced him to us, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, in one of the most beautiful way possible. Allah azza wa jal is telling us why did he select Ibrahim out of all the prophets and the anbiya. He mentioned about Ibrahim alayhi salam in the story when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, uh, blessed him with his son Ismail. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam was, was commissioned with the rebuilding of the Kaaba. And he did that with his son Ismail. And then he was tested afterwards with his son Ismail as well too. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us about Ibrahim alayhi salam, قَالْ وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِلَّا مَنْ سَتِعَ نَفْسَ Those who turn away from the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam, they're deceiving themselves. You're fooling yourself. If you find any other way besides the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam, you are fooling yourself. Obviously the way of Ibrahim is the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well too. And what is that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he selected him in this dunya and he's going to make him from the salihin in the akhirah. إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلَمْ When Allah told him, submit yourself to the will of your Lord. What did he say? قَالَ أَسْلَمْ to the Rabbil Alameen I submit myself to the, to, the, to the Lord of the world. No question asked. Ibrahim alayhi salam was the manifestation of the meaning of submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the manifestation of that. And because of that, his household followed his, his example. And because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this household very special, very well recognized, that you are now given salawat upon Ibrahim alayhi salam and his family in your salah, every single salah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala Ibrahim, right? We always say that. Why is this so special about Ibrahim alayhi salam? Today, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm speaking about 20 years. I remember 20 years ago when we used to go to Muslim conferences and we give talks over there. Some people after the class, they come or after the session, they come to and ask you questions like, what's the meaning of this ayah? Why the Prophet ﷺ say this in the hadith? How can we understand this hadith? That's how they used to ask back then. Then, a few years later, people start asking in these conferences questions like, why would Allah subhanahu say this in the Quran? Why would the Prophet ﷺ, you know, say this like in the hadith? Why, why do we, why, why is it that, you know, we have to do this? And then later on, the questions are coming later on recently, questions such as, why do I have to follow the Quran? Why the hadith? I mean, the hadith is just like, group of people can bear the hadith. How do I know it's authentic or, or true or not about the Prophet ﷺ? You can see the progression right now, the ideas. How our younger generations uh, start kind of getting to this very dangerous moment, which is even challenging the authority of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Once you challenge the authority of Allah Azza wa Jal, there is no submission anymore to it. And once they leave that submission to Allah Azza wa Jal, what happens to them? They develop that individuality again. Why do I have to do that? I mean, and then starts questioning the presence of God altogether. So let's try to understand what is submission from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Why is it so important to you and I and our families to truly submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can this save us today? And what do we need to do to truly become among those who submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I'm just going to start first with the, the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the family of Ibrahim to become the example of submission. When we say the word submission, the Arabic word for it, example to it as well, is actually al-Islam, al-Taslim, al-Istislam. And you guys all recognize the word al-Islam, which is your faith and your deen. So you being a Muslim means truly the one who truly submits to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You truly submit to the will of Allah azza wa jalla. What does it mean to submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And, and the other Arabic word for it is al-khudu'. Al-khudu' which means what? You, kinda, you humble yourself. You humble yourself and it's humbleness and humility for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now how do you manifest that? Through true ubudiyya lillah azza wa jal. By subjecting yourself 
to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by enslaving your desires, enslaving your nafs and your will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We live in a time, obviously because of the history of this country and also the history of mankind, when the word slavery comes with very negative connotation. And truly it is. But in the Quran, to be a true servant of Allah, a true slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a great honor. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about al-salihin, ibad al-Rahman, he calls them. The servant and the slaves of al-Rahman, the most merciful. When he spoke about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says what? the asra bi abidihi. Praise be to Allah, the one who took his servant, his abd, his slave, on that magnificent journey. So to be a true servant, a true slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a great honor. Because once you, sub you subject yourself to him and only to him, everything else becomes easy for you to challenge and also to confront and deal with. Because now you're empowered by the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your heart. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he grew up with this. He cared about nobody except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In his very young age, in his young age, what did he do? He challenged the norm of his entire society. I don't know if you know that, but Ibrahim alayhi salam grew up in a, in a relatively wealthy family. He grew up in Mesopotamia, which was the greatest nation, the greatest civilization of that time. In Iraq, modern day. He grew up over there. His society worshipped the idol, worshipped the stars, and worshipped the planets and so on. And he challenged them. He didn't, of course, from a very young age, he, he was even arguing with his father and, and the people of his time. But then what that was that decisive moment in his life. And he wanted to change and wanted to challenge his entire society. Look, like imagine in our time somebody comes to challenge this whole establishment we have in our society. The entire culture of our time. Comes and stands, you know, against all this. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he didn't conform with the, with, that, with the norm of his society. So what did he do? When his people went out on their Eid day, they have a, a festivity. So they all went to celebrate and finishing that celebration at night but in the evening to come back to their temple so they can worship their gods. So they planned everything well. Now while, when they left, Ibrahim alayhi salam, this young man, he goes to the major, to the big temple and he grabs an axe in his hand and he looks at this god and he looks at them and he's asking, he knows they're not going to answer, of course, obviously, but for the sake of argument. Like, are you going to defend yourself? The answer is, of course, no, nothing. He didn't, he didn't get anything. He starts smashing all these idols in a metaphoric way, smashing all these falsehoods of his society. And he kept the major one and put that axe on the shoulder and then he left. When his people ran out, imagine now how furious they're going to be. They're coming right now to, to, the, to the manifestation of their faith, also their celebration. They come into the temple with all the, the political leadership and the tribal leadership and the clergy and everybody to celebrate. To find what? The ones they're supposed to celebrate, they couldn't even defend themselves. They're all on the ground, smashed. So what did they say? Who dares to do this to our God? So they start talking among themselves and then somebody says, we know that there was a young man, he kept talking about our God. His name is Ibrahim. Do you guys know him? Of course. Bring him. And they, they brought Ibrahim alayhi salam. Like, did you really do this to our God? Ibrahim is like, me? Why don't you talk to him? Yeah, he's the one who has the axe on his shoulder. You should be talking to him. So they told us, you know they cannot speak, said, really. They can't even defend themselves. Why would they even worship him? SubhanAllah, their fitra, their fitra, almost, almost protected them from falling into Udu Billah, the kufr again. But their arrogance and their ego brought them back again to falsehood, which is what unfortunately was doing to many of us today in our society. You talk to people who have these ideas and these ideologies, and when you talk to them, the fitra is kicking in. The truth is obvious and clear. But for the sake of a political gain, or a political position in the society, they're willing to, to uh, subdue that and completely push it back and push it down, just for the sake of taking name and fame and a, and a political stance on these matters. So they deny the truth. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he did that, 
obviously. He said, you know what? You have to, you have to defend your God. Right now. Show him that you will defend your God. And show the people you're going to defend your God. So what do they do? He says, we need to burn him. A public display for the whole society to see what we're going to do with these. With dare, dare to challenge our God. And they start lighting a big fire. They say the fire took days just to, to, keep, to keep it you know, running and, and on all day and all night. Even people from different nations around the area, they could see the flame in the, in the darkness of the night. And because it's something huge and big, they knew something major was going to happen. So everybody was gathering to see what they're going to do with this fire. And when they brought Ibrahim on the day of execution, it was too big of a fire that they could not even come close to put him into the fire. They had to catapult him into the fire. And as he was flying into the air, imagine yourself right now in this position. You are in prison for these days and weeks probably. Barely feeding you with anything. Maybe you hurt and even insulted, probably even beaten, whatever. When they bring him out right now, he's tied with chains, with hands, his hands to his neck and his feet as well too. So basically, in terms of material, materialism, he loses, he lost all hope to be released. In terms of people defending him, in, even his father, including his own father, gave up on him. He's not going to defend him. So no one is going to defend Ibrahim a.s. In that moment, when people become hopeless and helpless, what do they usually do? They look for whatever, whatever you know, path or, or even exit that they can find to help them to get out of it. Ibrahim as he was flying into the air. How long does it take to fly into the air just to fall into the fire? Seconds. Few seconds. Jibreel comes to Ibrahim a.s. Qala Ibrahim halaka min haja. Do you need help? Now imagine yourself flying into the air and Jibreel comes to you. Do you need help? What would you tell Jibreel alayhi salam? Probably you hold on to him. So what are you talking about? Of course I need help, right? Ibrahim alayhi salam in those moments, those split second moments, with full confidence and absolute rida, absolute acceptance of Allah's judgment and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's test for him. He says, Amma ilayka fala haja. From you I need nothing. وَلَكِنْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمِ الْوَكِيلِ But I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient for me and my reliance is only on Him. And to this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instantly changed the law of the fire. The fire is supposed to do what, did you mind? It's supposed to burn. And Allah says, قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُلْ يُبَرْدٍ وَسَلَامًا عَلَى إِبْرَاهِمٍ Allah said to the fire, be cool. Don't hurt him. And it didn't. SubhanAllah, when he came out from that, from the fire, now what do you expect people to do? You're, su you're supposed to submit. Supposed to submit. Like it's a miracle. But instead, they again, they covered and concealed their fitrah. And their ego and their arrogance kicked in and told them, oh my God, this person is untouchable. What does that mean? He's cursed. SubhanAllah, they did give interpretation. <laughs> he is cursed. Stay away from him. And that's why his father, even when, he had to, when, when Ibrahim wanted to have a conversation with his dad, what did he tell him? Qala arjumannuk. Stay away from me, otherwise I'm going to stone you. I'm going to throw rocks at you. Stay away from me. Subhanallah. This is exactly what happens in our society today. People are completely concealing their futra, altering their futra, changing the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creation of mankind. And you come and you talk to them and bring them to their senses, what do they say to you? I'm going to throw rocks at you. Not physical rocks. You've seen the videos when you try to talk to them, they start yelling at you and barking and doing all these silly, stupid things. Because there's no argument. There's really no argument there. And here in our society, because we've just removed God from the equation, we're falling into all these falsehoods. Allah understand. Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him. But he said, you know what, there's no place for me here. I'm going to have to travel. And he did. He went to Asha. And then he went to Egypt. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with his wife, Sarah, and then Hajar. And then uh, in, a long, in an old age, Allah Azza wa Jal gave Ibrahim alayhi salam his first child, Ismail. Ibrahim alayhi salam was in his 60s or some they say 80s actually when he had his first child. An old age. What does that mean? All his service to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he was submitting himself to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not having any help, any assistance, any 
and each other. He didn't complain about that. He was always making dua and hinting. My Lord, make me among my offspring, among, the, among those who worship you and, and, and fulfill the salat for you. Our ulama of tafsir, they say he, is, he used to make this dua when he didn't even have kids yet. But he was very hopeful. He's making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give me. And Allah eventually gave him his child, Ismail. After all these years, where did he have a child? And then he's best with a child. He should celebrate, right? He barely had his child in his hand. And what was the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Ibrahim? Take your baby and his mom and send him all the way down south there in the desert. In the desert. Allah described that place as Ibrahim mentioned the ayah and the dua. Qa Rabbana, inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayri di zaran inda baytika al-muharram rabbana liyuqimu salah. Ya Rabb, my Lord, I'm leaving some of my family and offspring in a barren valley, dead valley that has no vegetation, nothing. Near your sacred house. So that they might pray and worship you. Ya Allah, I ask you to bring kind-hearted people to be with them. And to provide for them. From, from the fruits of the land. They might become grateful to you. This ayah has also another example of submission of Ibrahim alayhi salam. You see, if you leave your children in the desert like that, what is the first thing you're going to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your family? What are you going to ask? What are you going to ask? Protection? Food? Drink? Right? What was Ibrahim alayhi salam that asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ya Rabbi, Allah, make them to worship you. And bring them a good community. And then, Ya Allah, provide them food and, 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 and water. He made it the third thing to mention. Why is that? That shows how much, how much trust Ibrahim السلام, has in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he knows that Allah azza wa jal will provide. He wasn't concerned about them. That wasn't his concern. He knew Allah will take care of them. But his concern, will they find guidance? Will they find, will they find good community around them? That's what he's concerned about. And all of us today in our time, subhanAllah, because again, our heart is not with Allah Azza wa Jal, it's with the paycheck, with the job, with the effort I'm putting. Because we think our money comes from what? From our degrees, our jobs, our, the number of hours that we work so hard with. And so we think this is, this is our risk. No, this is not. This is just the means to receive your provision and your risk. But your risk comes from whom? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you have the true submission on Allah Azza wa Jal, you would not, you would not consume your life with just pursuing this dunya. You will definitely focus on put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while you're doing your part. That's it. I'll do my best and Allah will provide for me subhanahu wa ta'ala. To show the submission in the household of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Hajar, of course, obviously she was with her husband Ismail, Ibrahim for some time. And she learned from him the meaning of submission to Allah azza wa jal. So when Ibrahim brought her and, her and his son to the desert, as he was leaving, it was mentioned in the seer that she called Ibrahim alayhi salam, qalat, ya Ibrahim, ya Ibrahim, Ibrahim, where are you leaving us? Where are you leaving us? Now, obviously, in a situation like this, she's weak, she's alone with a baby, doesn't have enough food maybe to survive the day, let alone you know, to be by herself all this time. And it's a, as Allah described, it's a complete dead valley. There's nothing to, to, eat, to feed off. So she asked Ibrahim, Ya Ibrahim, where are you leaving us? And then she asked him, she goes, is this what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you? Is that the command of Allah? They say in the story that Ibrahim alayhi salam did not even turn back to look at her. Because Allah told him to drop them off and just leave. Which he did. He didn't even wait. And as he was leaving, she asked him, he didn't even turn, turn back to look at her. He said, Allahumma na'am. Yes, true, that's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She told him, then go. Allah will take care of us. That is submission. From him and from his wife. She knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of her. But then she also needed to do her part. So when her baby starts crying, what did she do? She started running between the mountains, looking for any caravan, any sign of life, anything, anything. But then after she, she was going back and forth seven times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught her and taught us a lesson. Where did the water come out from, Yajma? In, in the story. From underneath the feet of her baby, Ismail himself. 
She was running these errands to look for something for him, and Allah says, look, that what you're looking for, I'll bring it under his feet. A lesson to all of us, that you might be running the errand, you might be doing all the hard work, at the end of the day, our risk comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from your running between the mountains. So if you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, truly, the little effort you put in this dunya, Allah will put so much barakah in it. In the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qala wallahi law annakum tatawakkaluna ala Allahi haqqa tawakkulu. If you truly put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you truly put your reliance on Allah azza wa jal, haqqa tawakkulu. La razaqakum kama yarzaqu al-tayr. He will provide to you like he would do to the tayr, to the bird. They leave empty stomach in the morning, taqdu khimasa wa taruhu bitana. And they come back with full stomach. Now, when these birds, they leave, they don't have a job, eight to five, Jum'ah. So they go, they, they pursue their risk, and Allah will provide for them. And same thing with us. If we put to our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will provide. Now, the other example of submission in the household of Ibrahim, salam, his son, Ismail. Many years later, the child now becomes, mashallah, balagha ashuddah, reach that age, where his father can utilize his, his energy and his youth, alhamdulillah, to serve the, to serve the Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he comes to Ismail. Now one of the beautiful things that honestly we don't pay attention to in the story is that with all the distance between him and his father, his mother raised him to be obedient to his father. So when his father came back, he was still obedient to his father. Although they didn't have much connection between, among them for too long. So when he asked him, the Lord is asking us to rebuild the Kaaba, he goes, Samayana wa ta'ala, we listen, we obey. And they start building the Kaaba. Why do you Ibrahim al Khawaid min al Bayt wa Ismail? They start raising the foundation of the Kaaba, Rabbana taqabbal minna. With every brick that they were raising, they used to say, Rabbana taqabbal minna, or Allah accept from us. Inna kanta samim alim. And then they say, Rabbana waj'alna muslimayn laka wa min dhuriyatina ummatan muslimatan lak. Ya Allah, make us among those who submit themselves to you, and from our, offs- from our offspring, make the a nation that will submit to you. This dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam is about you guys. The offspring of this ummah. You are the followers of Ibrahim's way. You submit yourself to him. And that's why Allah says, Who was among Muslimin among Qabil? It is he who called you Muslims. Like he's the one who made this a term for us to use as Muslimin. So therefore, we submit. Then when the, when the Kaaba was built and they finished the Kaaba, what should happen after that? Celebration. You know, when you make a big event, what happens? You celebrate that and you take rest, recreational time. Instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Ibrahim, it's time to celebrate, sacrifice your son. The one that just helped you build the Kaaba, you need to sacrifice that, that child. Can you imagine the test after test after test that Ibrahim had to go through, Jama? Can you imagine that? And then he was tested with his son Ismail. What do we learn from that example to be specific here? Our biggest test, our biggest test usually comes in our life from those whom we love the most. Husband and wife having issues with each other. Parents and their children. You and your parents. You and your siblings. Those who are supposed to love the most, subhanAllah. And then you have your biggest test come from them. Ibrahim alayhi salam, because Allah told him afterwards, العظيم, this was the greatest test that he had to go through. So Allah told him that you need to sacrifice your son. He comes to his son, قال يا بنية, إني أرى في المنام أن يذبحك فانظر ماذا فعل. I see that I'm sacrificing you. What do we do? His son, with full submission, what did he say? قال يا بتي فعل ما تؤمر. If this is coming from Allah, do it. ستجد مني إن شاء الله من الصابرين. You should find me among those who are patient. And then Allah described that scene. He said, قلم فلما أسلم. When they both, when they both submitted themselves to the will of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. وتلهو للجبين. And he's about now describing in a, in a very vivid way. The, the position where he's about to sacrifice his son. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Ibrahim alayhi salam, Qad sadaqta ru'ya. This is it. You pass. No more tests for you, Ibrahim. After this, khalas. You proved yourself completely. So this is an example you see in, the, in Ibrahim, the father, Hajar, the mother, Ismail, the child. They all manifested this concept of submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our problem today is once God is taken out of the equation, people start making themselves gods. 
as Allah described in the Quran. Have you seen the one who made his, his own desires as his own God? Like this sense of extreme and radical level of individualism is what killing us and killing our society. And if we don't submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we are gonna be, we're going to be ruined. Allah Azza says about some of these people who did not submit themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. قال, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ يَزْعُمُونَ أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ يُرِيدُونَ يَتَحَاكَمُوا إِلَى الطَّاغُوتِ وَقَدْ أُمِرُوا أَنْ يَكْفُرُوا بِهِ وَيَرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانِ يُنْدُلْ لَهُمْ ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't you see about these people who claim that they believe? They believe in what was revealed to you and those before you. But whenever they have an opportunity, they would go and rule by what? At-Taghut. They don't submit themselves to Allah's command. They submit themselves to the command of human beings, others, and people. Well, read the shaytan, yudullahum dalalam ba'idah. That's because the shaytan wants to lead them astray. And he did. And if they were told, come, come back. Just listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's fitra, Allah's command, Allah's rules. What would they say? If you ask them to come back to Allah under the command of the Prophet what would they say? The hypocrites, they just turn away from you. So no, 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 no. They just want to follow their desires. This is exactly the description of our time. Many people, they follow their desires. Shaitan is leading them astray even worse and worse. And then when you try to reason with them, they turn away from you. Why? Because they still want to continue to follow their own desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah Azza wa Jalla, What's wrong with them? Their hearts are diseased. They have so many doubts. Like they don't have any uh, any certainty of the akhirah. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it very easy. Look, you're going to die eventually. Like no matter how much you think you're in control of your personal life, for how long? And eventually you're going to die. So if you're going to die, then you don't have control over this life to begin with. Someone else has controlled the cycle of life. So instead of trying to defy that, try to, try to find it. Find the truth about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that also brings us, of course, to the Muslimin today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us about, to the Muslim, that our job is what? That if when, Allah, when a command comes from Allah azza wa jal, there is no khiyara for you. كَمَا قَالَ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَ وَمَا كَانَ لُمُؤْمِنُ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَ فِي إِذَا قَضَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ it's not for a believing man or woman when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees something that they make a choice beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree. You can't make a choice if Allah decreed something to be for you to follow. And that's what is happening today. We have the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet and clear to us with the command of Allah azza wa jal, but people just following their different paths and different ideologies and different ways. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commanded us, قال, سَمِعْنَا وَاطَعْنَا وَفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ this is our path, that we always say, we listen and we obey. And to you, our Lord, is our return. Now, the Prophet ﷺ warned us about something specific. I want to mention it over here, because now it is one of the problems we have, not just that denying the Quran, also denying the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, which is more common. Like you hand people who come and say, look, I listen to the Quran. But the Sunnah, I don't know, that's Abu Hurairah, Fulan, I don't know. Well, the Prophet ﷺ warned us again this. In Surah Nabi Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ said, قال في الحديث, ألا I don't want to see, he said, I don't want to see one of you in the future, he said, will be reclining on their couch, mashallah, like basically very, very comfortable with themselves. And then they will be informed about the command that comes from me, like command from the Prophet something I ordered to do or to, to refrain you from doing. We said, you know what, I don't know. Whatever we find in the book of Allah, we follow. Which means what? They deny the sunnah of the Prophet Even though Allah says in the Quran, Whatever comes to you from Allah, take it. And whatever uh, 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 the Prophet Muhammad he uh, uh, forbids you to, uh, of abstain from it. So in order for us to survive the fitter of our time, we have to bring our hearts back again to where it belongs, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This concept of submission requires from what what? Al-Khudur yalzamu al-imtithal. When you say that I submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it requires what? Imtithal. Imtithal means what? You need to, you need to show now that the, that the action. Are you? Are your actions really in line with your belief? 
If you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you to give, if Allah commands you to pray, if Allah commands you to stay away from this haram, do you follow the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is your heart submitting totally to Allah azza wa jal? We live in a time, unfortunately, that we now we say we're Muslims, alhamdulillah. And there are so many people out there who say Muslims. But when you look at their actions and their statements and their posts, it just it gives you a different vibe. Which explains the ayah in the Quran when Allah says, وَقَالَتِ الْعَرَابُ وَآمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا Some of the Bedouins, they said, we believe. Allah said, no, you didn't. You became Muslims only, that's it. Which means you only pronounced Islam, but you still did not practice Islam. So I need to make sure that I'm not just a Muslim. I need also to become a mu'min, take myself to the next level in my deen. And that is something that's extremely important for us to follow, inshallah, to barakah wa ta'ala. How can I become a Muslim, a true Muslim? What do I need to do exactly? A few things I want to share with you, inshallah, to barakah wa ta'ala. Number one, to really follow the true meaning of, of Islam or submission to the Lord of Allah, azza wa jal. What you need to do is, number one, to, uh, uh, um, to accept to accept the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how hard, how difficult that is. How can you accept Allah's decree subhanahu wa ta'ala? By strengthening your true belief in His oneness. Because if you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one and only, He is the one who deserves to be worshipped. And only to be worshipped, what is left for you? Obey His command. Whatever comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to have to accept that. What if that was something difficult and hard? Allah says, وَعَسَ أَنْ تَكْرَوَ شَيْءَ وَجَعَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرٍ كَثِيرًا you might dislike something, and Allah will put so much hair there for you in that balance. So you need to teach your heart to become accepting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command and qadr. The other thing that we need to also is to, to understand that having a true, strong faith is khair, and it's all the khair that you need in this dunya and the akhirah. Like to have a true iman. Being a Muslim is no longer sufficient. In Hayat Jibreel, when he came to the Prophet وسلم, in the form of a man, and he asked him, Al-Islam, Al-Iman, Al-Ihsan. He said, what is Islam? What is Iman? What is Ihsan? Our ulama, they say, look, like Ibn Qayyim, he said, look, these are darajat, which means Islam is a journey. In our terms, we could say Islam is a journey. You never stop on that journey because there's a destination you're going to have to reach, and that's the Ihsan, the best part and the, the, the true manifestation of being a Muslim. First, you say, La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah, you start practicing. Then, that practice translates in what? In transformation in your heart. Spirituality in the heart is overwhelming. To the level that takes you to what? As if you're seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's ihsan, the highest level. So you need to upgrade yourself. That iman we're talking about, you're not, it's not sufficient in our time just to say I'm a Muslim. What matters is what? To prove it. So to prove it, I need to practice that iman and jama'ah all the time. Whatever khair I can practice, we do it. Nowadays, unfortunately, many people, they come to you and they ask you questions such as, is this wajib or mustahab? You say it's mustahab, say alhamdulillah. What does that even mean? Like, I don't have to do it. I said, I didn't say you, don't, you need to do it. I said, it's mustahab, it's recommended that you do it. But for us, the mustahab means don't do it. And the makruh, dislike, means what? Do it. Yeah, it's dislike. Let's do it. You see how our himma, where our now standards are becoming? Our practice is below where we need to be. So I want you to think about this. So first of all, to accept Allah's command, no matter how difficult that is. Number two, to put into action. To practice this. No matter how difficult that is. Because that's when you upgrade yourself, inshallah, wa ta'ala. And also, the way we need to, in order for us to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to practice tawakkul. Trust in Allah Azza wa Many of us, like I said, do we believe that we get only what we work for. You know, that equation, mathematically speaking, yeah, it might be like this. One plus one equals two. But dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one plus one could equal actually a thousand. Just like a thousand plus thousand could equal maybe five. What does that mean? Your effort, your effort, or actually the result, is not depending on the effort. It depends on who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah azza wa So your job is to put the effort. That's it. And you might be even putting everything right. And Allah still will test you with a result that is not comparable to how much effort you put into it. And it could be the opposite. 
You don't put much effort, but with so much sincerity, you get so much khair and barakah from it. Like, wow, how this happened? Like, somebody's working so hard, and they're barely getting, getting empty crumbs. And other people just having a simple life, but subhanAllah, there's so much enjoy with, enjoy with their life. Like, take an example of rich people who are not happy with what they have, and a poor person who's satisfied with what they have. Who do you think have a better life, Ajima? The one who have all these mansions and all these fancy cars and so on, they cannot even enjoy eating their food without feeling, you know, scared if they're going to be, you know, poisoned or maybe get sick or this and that. Or somebody who doesn't have much really, but subhanAllah, whatever they eat, they're so happy with it. And Allah, I've seen it. I've seen it. We went one time, just to give an example of this, this actually acceptance and, and having tawakkul. We went one time delivering some of uh, uh, food to some of those masakini and in some of the, the refugee camps. And as we were delivering the stuff and we were leaving, so the, the man, of course, out of uh, yani, uh, dignified family, subhanAllah, they, he insists that you're not going to leave until you, uh, um, until you serve your tea. Ya akhi, jazakallah khair, we don't need wallah. No, you, you're not going to leave until you serve, you serve your tea. He said, okay, bismillah. They brought the, the tray. The tray is bent. The cups, each cup is, looks different than the other one. Simplicity. And you look in the room, there are a couple of cushions that you sit on them, and the rest of it is just nothing, really. So when we're done, alhamdulillah, as we we're about to leave, so we said, anything else we can help you with before we leave? He goes, alhamdulillah, we have everything. And wallah, we look at each other and say, what is he talking about? What is that everything he's talking about? But I think, again, he has everything in his heart. That's what matters, really. Because here in Dallas, I meet tons of people. Tons of people come to my office so anxious, with an anxiety and, and, and depression and so on. Why? A children, for example, because their parents are not allowing them to use their phones, for example. Or these people, because you know what, they're afraid that they, you know, their money is going to go down, drop down. Like one time I was in a conversation, subhanAllah, long time ago, with people whom Allah blessed with so much khairi, and subhanAllah. And, uh, and I was, I was, I was kind of in my, in my mind, I was like, what, what are these people talking about? But they say, you know, the economy is going so bad. One of them is saying, the economy is going so bad. Last year, I did only two million. And I'm like, uh, well, in my mind, it's like, did I just hear the, 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 the numbers right, Yani? <laughs> like, I, did, I only did two million. And it's like, hmm, mashallah. And at that time, I don't know how much uh, I, I, I made, Yani. <laughs> it, it, was just, it was just the way people think, it will baffle you. You need to submit, accept Allah's command and commandment. You need to make sure to practice that with the Iman, upgrade your Iman to the level of Ihsan. And you need to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you only have to put the effort, the rest of it in the, in, in the, in the hand of Allah Azza wa Jal. And finally, in order for you to have that full submission is a rida. What's the meaning of a rida, Ajima? Acceptance. This is the thing that we, we, we lack a lot in our community today. Not so many people are just satisfied and content with what they have. Some families, Allah bless them, Masha with beautiful children, they're not content with that. Some people have financial issues and they're not content with their life. Other people, they have, you know, marital issues. Everybody's hala is having some issues, but we never feel satisfied with anything that Allah blesses us. And we look at other people's ni'am and blessings. You would like to find out submission? Accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's judgment. But that doesn't mean not to improve your life. But you put the effort, and then the results are in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that submission of heart, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah to give us the light of guidance in our heart, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who follow the example of Ibrahim alayhi salam, and the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And I ask Allah azza wa jal, to show us that which is right and make it easy for us to follow it, and that which is wrong and make it easy for us to stay away from it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who will have qalbun salim. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our hearts submit to His will and His will alone, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to arrive at the status of ihsan, Ya Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us our ihsan in this dunya, ihsan in our a'mal, ihsan the reward, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And the way we all gather in this space, in, in this dunya, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we gather together in Jannah al Firdaus al A'la with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa baraka alayhi wa sallam.